invite um, the speakers to come up and we have a little time for conversation. Oh, we and again, I'm going to ask you that if you have a question that you please speak into the microphones, which we have stationary there and over there. I have a question for Professor Latimer. Yes. Um, I'm just wondering to what extent uh, uh, Gertrude, Gertrude Stein and her circle were part of the larger movement of the discovery of sexuality at the dawn of the uh, 20th century with the notion that it was an ingrown phenomenon and that masturbation and prostitutes didn't cause vice, but we were responding to our own inner feelings. I'm not sure I understood the question in that. I, I understand the statement in that, yeah. but what 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 is I'm it? I'm just wondering that what I the relationship illuminate. is between Stein and her circle and this broader uh, uh, trend. Um, well, I, I'll try to front load my answer. Sure. That's a, a really uh, complex question, and um, a lot of the people in in Stein's life and community were reading sexological texts and looking uh, in them and in their contradictions for um, different um, cues, I guess, and clues about their own uh, desires and um, ways to live out their lives with dignity. Um, I think particularly for lesbians because women uh, at that time uh, were disenfranchised, were not fully citizens, um, that uh, the question is perhaps even more complex than it, it might be for their male uh, counterparts and for the men that, that, that Stein hung out with of what relationship they might have to emerging notions of uh, uh, dissident sexuality or, or variant sexuality. Stein herself um, uh, was, um, I think, uh, convinced by reading um, Otto Weininger that genius was inherently male and that lesbians moving toward a masculine position um, were more uh, moving toward the possibility of being considered a genius, and that's kind of all she really had to know. Uh, that's really what interested her, and that's really what interested her, why she hung out with men instead of women as well, um, because for her, uh, that position and its possibilities, the position of masculinity, the socially enfranchised position of masculinity was... Um, was where the horizons were, were open and where she saw her future and where she wanted uh, to be. So um, complicated, not just about sexuality, but, but, but about possibility and how, how to live uh, fully a, a, a creative uh, uh, life and to become a, a legend, which was manifestly her desire. But um, other people were more in, you know, a critical dialogue with sexological texts uh, like Virginia Woolf or even uh, June Barnes or Natalie Barney uh, than uh, St Stein was. For her, um, there was there was you know um, she ha she had her she had different priorities. Thanks for your question. Hi. Um, I, well, in terms of while just as you were talking, it was a really wonderful paper and. Um, I also just have more of an observation and a comment, um, which is about, uh, I thought I found very provocative your statement about how Faith Ringgold's work registers the intimate and domestic spaces within, from within which art emerge, or from which art emerges, and this being the place where it happens in a way first. Um, I found that really provocative um, and a beautiful way of connecting the kind of sentimental texture of the work itself, um, which is, I, I, it's a kind of work that 
doesn't kind of gel with discourse in contemporary art history um, and, and you know, sort of notions of sophistication and value and the like. And I think you did an incredible job of just circumventing, short circuiting, totally disarming um, um, that way of thinking. So, um, and this is sort of related, I'm gonna segue to Tavia's talk because um, I, started, I started working um, both in pop art and then also in Thomas Aikens, which is a weird pairing. Um, with somewhat obvious connections too. Um, <laughs> but um, uh, one of the things that I've always been drawn to in Aikens' paintings as well as portraits, other portraits from 19th century American painters um, um, or M Americans were disidentifying with America, John Singer Sargent pops into mind, um, is the rich texture um, um, of their canvases when they take on dress and especially feminine dress. And I don't have any kind of a sophisticated theoretical connection between this I find really seductive and moving um, part of their work, which to me feels queer or disruptive. And I know for Aikens, you can actually absolutely connect that um, to his interest in the nude body and his interest in actually shedding the illusory and um, um, the fraudulent um, trappings of conventions of representing femininity. Um, you know, but I found your I found the ways in which you were writing about a popular culture in popular visual culture in America in the 19th century really really resonant for thinking about. 19th century painting. With that, I actually have kind of a concrete que question, which um, is kept totally also self-interested as something moving back and forth between 19th century and like contemporary performance art. Um, having read some of your uh, wonderful writing about the performance artist Caleb Lindsay, I was wondering if I could ask if this work that you have done in 19th century, uh, in, queer, in queer figures in the 19th century, in race and performance and gender, and if this has informed the ways in which you approach contemporary performance artists uh, like Caleb Lindsay? <laughs> um, thank you, Jennifer. That's a really good question. Um, and I'd like to have a conversation uh, in, uh, uh, with you afterwards about it. Um, you know, um, I think like, like you, um, it's a bit of a shift for me to go back and forth between historical and archival materials working with um, um, I guess with subjects uh, about whom I assume we kind of begin with the assumption we have this very limited um, extant uh, materials. I think one of the reasons why this Swally case has been so attractive to me and to other people is we have this amazing image. Um, there, are, there are no doubt comparable cases in the, in the archive, but um, this particular, this document and artwork is so um, is so resonant and continues to do this, um, I guess, kind of performative work, right? It continues to, um, it's not to my knowledge been exhibited, which is an interesting question. I've been doing some uh, studying to that, but it could be, you know, it's, it's, the, it's, it's the, it, it would work, it's, it's, it's stunning, visually stunning. And um, I guess I would, so I would connect it in a way um, with, uh, to, um, uh, my interest in how um, popular traditions, we were talking about masking traditions and um, uh, masking and masquerade, both specific art historical lineages that one can draw in African and African American, African diasporic cultures, but just more generally these modes of transmission through performance um, that are like gossip, hard to, uh, certainly hard to document. Um, and another reason that the, um, the Swali print has proved so rich and suggestive to people because it's sort of at, you know, about a century before most people gave in to look at things like drag balls in Harlem in the, during the Harlem Renaissance, we have this, we have this amazing uh, image which, which makes us wonder, like, how long has this been going on? <laughs> and we don't necessarily know, but I think by looking at parallel, by, by drawing, uh, by drawing, um, uh, at unrelated imagery of masquerade, um, uh, dress, uh, self-fashioning in that period, I can look to the different moments in which these traces kind of emerge in the archive and kind of indicate a kind of richness of a, of a popular tradition. And that, just to kind of go back to, to Caleb Lindsay, um, is uh, not so much the 19th century, but certainly in the 20th century, a lot of his work uh, is uh, engaging in popular vernacular African American traditions of hokum and body, uh, the blues. Someone put up Gladys Bentley earlier. Um, 
this, these are traditions that are actually relatively more documented once you get to the 20th century. We have race records, we have newsprints, uh, newspaper record, uh, articles, we have the African American press that, that followed drag balls beginning in the, in the 20s. So, um, but he is, like Leslie Saar, uh, taking this history and um, um, uh, I guess making it a kind of archive of feelings and reinterpreting it in terms of what it might mean for a kind of present black queer performance and uh, vis visibility, but also <laughs> kind of disappearing. Thanks. Um, sorry, I hate these things. My question is also for Tavia. Um, and first, I wanted to say thank you for that wonderful paper. And I'm sorry for this schedule change uh, because I think a lot of people who arrived uh, on the basis of the original schedule missed a lot of that paper and I wish that they would heard it in their entirety, um, in Tavia's paper, that is to say, in, in its entirety. Um, I also missed the first minute or two myself. Um, so you may have answered this and if so, I apologize. But um, I wanted to think about, um, and this is to some extent asking you to reprise your, your argument in the amalgamation waltz, but I wanted to think about um, the relationship between the image that you were um, dilating upon and um, the image that Diana Linden showed in her paper very briefly, I think it was the only 19th century image there, the London Anti-Slavery Society, seal am I a man and a brother, um, and following also the turn that you took, can you hear me? I'm sorry, you guys are no, sort of. I can't. I'm sorry. hearing impaired, okay. I can't hear you, and you're speaking really fast. Oh, so I do that. That was better. Ah, yeah. did, do you want me to reprise the whole thing? No, I think you're fine. Okay, <laughs> so thank you. Uh, <laughs> I couldn't figure out what, what you were um, signing. Um, to, um, I wanted to ask you to reflect a little bit um, on the relationship between uh, the image that you were dilating upon in your paper and the image that Diana Linden showed in her paper, the London Anti-Slavery Society Seal, um, which to some extent, again, um, represses your argument in the Amalgamation Waltz, but I wanted you to try to follow the turn that you were making in this paper in terms of thinking about the relationship in terms of visual culture. So, does that make sense? Um. I, I think it does. Um, could you just say one more uh, thing about what relationship that you might see between, you, you're talking about the Wedgwood uh, icon, yeah. am I not a man and a brother? Right. Um, is there a particular aspect of it that you would like me to think about in relation to Sawali and? Um, I suppose it's historically um, uh, resonant and prominently circulated, but also very different images, white authored images of okay. black emasculation to, to Put it broadly. Oh, okay. Um, again, it's I think something I'd like to um, think about further. Um, one thing to note is that the Wedgwood icon was reproduced in two versions: mm -hmm. uh, "Am I not a man and a brother?" and also "Am I not a woman and a sister?" Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know that I would rush to characterize either of those as um, representations of emasculation. Mm -hmm. I think they need to be interpreted in relation to the uh, sentimental codes mm -hmm. of Christianity and Christian sentiment that were assumed to be the common discourse mm -hmm. of, the, of the period in terms of you know, moral suasion against slavery. And um, they do, however, have, I think, very interesting, now that you point them out, implications for um, the um, sexual imagination of the period that I'm looking at. And I think it's part of where I guess I'm going in terms of this research into uh, the intersections between abolitionist, uh, anti-abolitionist, and uh, just sort of popular gothic crime um, sensationalist imagery. Um, and a lot of that work, um, I guess I'll just bring this, <laughs> be brief in this, in this response. The, um, the new literature on kind of obscene imagery and texts and images in this period, I think is beginning to come out and is really shifting, I think, a lot of what we think we understand in part because this whole question of fronts and, you know, um, or just establishing fronts, right? The, the dominant society of the period, I think, to put it in a nutshell, was as much engaged in creating a front behind which a lot of else was going on as these sensible margins that they were exposing. I just want to add, um, when you're speaking, we're speaking about the Wedgwoods, um, and yes, th that there are two, a male, a female, this has been written about a lot um, by Kirk Savage in 
standing soldiers, kneeling slaves, but uh, also to think about how those images were then countered by Frederick Douglass's words of around 1893, around the World's Columbian Exhibition, and then also the um, photographic portraits that Sojourner Truth had commissioned of herself, which Noel Painter has written, um, written about, and that you know it's when describing Sojourner Truth, who like they always have to insist that she strips bare not just her arm but her breast the masculine quality to her arm as she's saying, am I not a woman also? And there's this kind of, I would just say if I look at the literature of Neil Penover, but there's a kind of counterbalance there. Um, we have time for one more before lunch. I'm Jonathan is, but I'm sorry, but Jonathan, are you sure? So selfless, thank you. It's one a quick more. one for Diana, since you brought up the uh, subject of masculinity and femininity. I was r wondering if you've written anything more on that topic. A masculinity and femininity? Or, or masculinity in itself. Have you written anything more on the subject of masculinity? Um. Uh, yeah, oh. <laughs> I'm like, uh, it's a former life. Um, I wrote about murals in Harlem Hospital by Charles Alston, who was Jacob Lawrence's teacher. Um, they deal with um, what's called, on one side it's primitive medicine, the other side it's modern medicine, and it deals a lot with different aspects of masculinity, ties to Africa, um, um, skin tone and privilege within African American community, and also outside voices who did not want the murals to be painted um, because, in the words of the 1930s, Negroes would not be interested in Negro subject matter and Harlem won't be Negro. So I, I guess that was it. Otherwise, it's been a lot of Ben Sean for a long time. Thank you all. We're going to break for lunch. Um, I've lost track of when we're reconvening, but it's in your program. Thank you all very much, and we'll see you in about an hour, hour and a half. I was going to ask you why you didn't.